July the 17th, 1918. The wheel had come full circle. Once again, as in 1914, all the war, all its potential, all its hopes and fears and deceitful promises were centered on the river Maun. And on the Maun, the war had reached a brief moment of equipoise. The last of the great German offensives on the Western Front had been launched three days before. By July the 17th, it had been halted by the combined efforts of French, British and American troops. General Ludendorff gave orders for the attack to cease. A continuation of the offensive would have cost us too much. General Foch, commander-in-chief of the Allied armies, asked... What indeed had been the results of this Friedensturm, which it had been so loudly proclaimed was to bring peace by one victorious rush? Nothing but bitterness and deception, forerunners of defeat. On the night of July the 17th, Ludendorff travelled northward to the headquarters of Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria to discuss the final offensive against the British army, which had always been his main intention. For the few quiet hours, while the equipoise lasted, the Germans remained unsuspected. Field Marshal von Hindenburg described their awakening. Suddenly, a violent hail of shells descended on the back areas. The enemy was undoubtedly attacking on the whole front from the Ain to the Marne. Three hundred and fifty French tanks rolled into the attack. American divisions spearheaded the main French onset. Really, uh, we started out uh, recklessly, like a holiday it was. Like, because uh, we didn't know, we didn't see any dead people yet, dead. no one was killed yet. So we started out, we followed the barrage, and uh, the first Germans we saw dead were in the first line. We leapfrogged that line, we followed our barrage, we continued, we followed it to the second line of German trenches. There, too, a lot of Germans were killed by our barrage, and there wasn't much opposition the first uh, half hour or so. When the Germans recovered from their surprise, resistance stiffened. It was never easy to defeat the German army. July the 29th, Mongin wrote, The struggle is very hard. We've had some success, but the Bosch is holding firmly onto the swing door which I'm trying to close.
Steadily, reluctantly, fighting stern rearguard actions, the Germans were forced to withdraw. Once again, the tide had turned. Once again, the German army was retreating from the River Marne. Hindenburg wrote, It was a grievous decision. How the enemy would rejoice if the word Marne were to mean a revolution in the military situation for the second time. Paris, and indeed all France, would breathe again. What would be the effect of this news on the whole world? we realized how many eyes and hearts would follow us with envy, hatred, and hope. The Germans had to bow to the inexorable. On August the 2nd, they evacuated Soissons. By August the 5th, the Second Battle of the Marne was over. had taken over 29,000 prisoners and nearly 800 guns. The German high command understood the significance of what had been done. In Ludendorff's words, the attempt to make the Entente incline to peace by means of German victories before the arrival of the American reinforcements had failed. The impetus of the army had not sufficed to deal the enemy a decisive blow before the Americans were on the spot in considerable force. It was quite clear to me that our general situation had thus become very serious. What would be the effect of this news on the whole world, asked Hindenburg. This indeed was a key question. In France, a great surge of relief greeted the retreat of the German armies and the removal of the threat to Paris. In America, there was pride at the part played in these great events by the young army of the Republic. These July battles were America's first awakening to the harsh truths of the war. American losses had been heavy as their high-spirited but inexperienced soldiers stormed into the attack. General Mangin, who commanded them, said, You rushed into the fight as though to a fate. The American comrades, I am grateful to you for the blood so generously spilled on the soil of my country. In Britain, the news of victory, after months of anxious waiting, months of shocked awareness of German strength, was treated with care. On August the 4th, as the battle was ending, Lord Rothermere wrote in the Sunday pictorial, We are still very far from our goal and we ought soberly to confront the situation as it now exists. Germany in 1918 had displayed to the world such ruthless force that men might well doubt the possibility of its waning. Yet in Germany, as the Battle of the Marne developed and the news of it reached the people, uneasy voices were heard and would not be stilled. The Cologne Gazette reported, Reviewing events at home during the fourth year of the war, the inference is obvious that a true offensive spirit is lacking at home. In this connection, there is no more instructive comparison than that of our arch enemy, Great Britain. For Britain's home front has no loopholes and no weak spots. The British government might ruefully smile to learn that Britain had no weak spots. There was a strike of munition workers in Coventry and Birmingham at the very climax of the Battle of the Marne. There was a strike of women operating London buses and trams, followed by the threat of another by women workers on the underground. There was a strike in the Yorkshire coal fields, coinciding with the disclosure of a serious Allied shortage of coal. There were searching queries by an ex-minister, Lord Lansdowne, about the very object of the war itself. 
There were continuing shipping losses, still in excess of new building. There were food shortages and a frightening influenza epidemic. There was a ferocious agitation against enemy aliens in Britain. A petition with one and a quarter million signatures demanded the internment of every alien forthwith. The largest mass meeting in Trafalgar Square since the outbreak of war urged the same thing. This rage against aliens displayed the hysterical element in Britain's will to victory. A letter to the Times said, At last the view of Germany as she really is, is dawning on the British people. They are beginning to think that with a nation so polluted and polluting, whose ideals are so false and whose human feeling is so dead, no people acknowledging the morals of Christianity or even of civilization ought, as it values its own soul, to have truck or dealing or even speech. On August the 8th, the London Times reported an article in the Frankfurter Zeitung. There would be little sense in yielding to illusions about what is before us. We shall have to go on fighting during the winter and doubtless during next summer also. And the troops which are crossing the ocean every day from America must feed the war, like fresh logs thrown upon a dying fire. And this will not make the fighting easy. On this day, August the 8th, fresh logs were indeed thrown on the fire. On July the 17th, the eve of Foch's counterstroke on the Marne, the British Commander-in-Chief, Sir Douglas Haig, had suggested to him a joint French and British attack to relieve the important rail centre of Amiens. This proposal, said Foch, was perfectly in harmony with my way of looking at the matter. On July the 20th, he wrote to Haig, Having reached the point where we now are, it is indispensable to seize the enemy and attack him wherever we can do so to our own advantage. The combined attack should be carried out at once. Haig had been preparing this stroke for over two months. He entrusted it to General Rawlinson's 4th Army. The whole British Army was now a very different force from the one which emerged from the great costly defensive battles of March and April. Haig recognized the transformation. Two months of comparative quiet worked a great change in the condition of the British armies. The drafts sent out from England had been largely absorbed. Many of the reinforcements from other fronts had arrived. And the number of our effective infantry divisions had risen from 45 to 52. In artillery, we were stronger than we had ever been. The British army was ready to take the offensive. By 1918, British war production was truly organized on the scale of these tremendous needs. In March and April, under the German hammer blows, the British Army lost over a thousand guns and vast quantities of war material. British production was able to replace these losses before the same battles were over. At the end of April, the King addressed a message to the munitions workers. The King has learned from the military authorities that practically all the losses and expenditure of munitions during the battle have already been made good without any undue depletion of normal reserves. Out of the resources which have been held in readiness and by the additional effort which has been made. There are now actually more serviceable guns, machine guns and aeroplanes with the British armies in the field than there were on the eve of the German attack. Thus fortified, Haig completed his preparations to counter-attack. But, as 1916 and 1917 had shown, something more was needed than filled ranks and vast stocks of war material. Secrecy. By every trick in the book, the British Fourth Army worked to achieve surprise. Every soldier had a notice pasted into his paybook. It said, Keep your mouth shut. The success of any operation we carry out depends chiefly on surprise. Do not talk. When you know that your unit is making preparations for an attack, don't talk about them to men in other units or to strangers. And keep your mouth shut, especially in public places. Do not be inquisitive about what other units are doing. 
If you hear or see anything, keep it to yourself. The success of the operations and the lives of your comrades depend on your silence. On July the 28th, Foch placed the first French army under Haig's command for the forthcoming battle. This was kept secret. Haig wrote to the French commander, to tell him that I would not call at his headquarters until operations had started, in order not to excite suspicion. Behind the Australians was massed another formidable fighting unit, the Canadian Corps, nearly a hundred thousand strong. This too was kept secret. Behind them all, to exploit a success, the Cavalry Corps was brought in, with over 15,000 horses to hide on the empty Somme uplands. Over 2,000 guns were assembled, also in secrecy. And since this was 1918, and a different style of war, Rawlinson had under his command, silently gathered, some 800 aircraft and 534 tanks. Of all this, the German high command knew nothing. On August the 4th, Ludendorff composed an order of the day. I'm under the impression that in many quarters, the possibility of an enemy offensive is viewed with a certain degree of apprehension. There is nothing to justify this apprehension, provided our troops are vigilant and do their duty. The Battle of Amiens opened at 4.20 a.m. on August the 8th. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved, and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. <laughs> O oh, guns, fall silent till the dead men hear above their heads the legions pressing on. O oh, flashing muzzles, pause, and let them see the coming dawn that streaks the sky afar. Then let your mighty chorus witness be to them and Caesar that we still make war. Tell them, O oh guns, that we have heard their call, that we have sworn and will not turn aside, that we will onward till we win or fall, that we will keep the faith for which they died. Cheroa, 8th of August. 400 tanks along the Amiens front. Is there a man alive of us who forgets? What a day. 400 tanks in line of battle. Good going, firm ground. The air grows electric. Two minutes to go. Watch his tick, heart's beat. One minute to go. Then the whole world upheaves. No words can describe it. Just the whole world heaves, rocks, tumbles, turns upside down, ricochets. We can see, hear, and feel nothing. The driver's on his seat, his hand on the clutch. Soon she's humming, sweet and low. I depress the pedal and she roars magnificently, like the great man-eater she is. She gives a lurch and a roll. The gunners spread their feet for balance, and we're off. Going was marvelous. Grass was just like you put in your front garden, just like a bit of Cumberland turf that was springy. You, th you felt you were in for a joyride. The 
plateau seen from the air was dotted with parties of infantry, field artillery and tanks moving forward. Staff officers were galloping about, many of them riding horses in battle for the first time. No enemy guns appeared to be firing and no coordinated defence was apparent. Only the Royal Air Force lacked the sense of overwhelming victory that day. During the hours that elapsed between the opening of the battle and the lifting of the morning mist, the Germans had time to summon air reinforcements to the Somme. As the British planes took off to fulfill their bombing missions against bridges, communications and troop concentrations, German squadrons assembled against them. The Richthofen squadron appeared. Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the most famous air ace of the war, was dead now, but his squadron, led by Captain Hermann Göring, was still a crack unit, a fearsome opponent to meet. The Royal Air Force lost 44 machines in battle, and 52 more were wrecked. On the ground, the battle flowed forward towards its unmistakable meaning. The tanks were going forward and taking position after position, the infantry following up behind, and even all the Germans brought their artillery out of their pits, it was of no avail that the Australians got all around them. While this was taking place, the horse artillery galloped into action, and in the meantime, German prisoners were coming up and but it was a morning of victory. You could feel the hair prickling up your spine with excitement because we knew that that was going to be the end of the, end of the war. By half past one, the Australians were on all their objectives. They had captured over 7,800 prisoners and 173 guns. The Canadians made the deepest advance, nearly eight miles, and took nearly 5,000 prisoners. Altogether, the British and French armies captured some 15,000 Germans that day. Was this the reward at last of patient years of endeavor was this what Vimy might have been, what Messines should have been, what Cambrai could have been? Field Marshal Haig wrote, The situation has developed more favorably for us than I, optimist though I am, had dared to hope. Ludendorff wrote, August the 8th was the black day of the German army in the history of this war. This was the worst experience that I had to go through. The Battle of Amiens was a new beginning, the glint of a new hope. The advance slowed, but the feel of a great occasion did not diminish. German resistance stiffened as usual, and each mile gained brought the British nearer to the old, devastated Somme battlefields of 1916, a dreadful wilderness to fight in. But Amiens, on August the 8th, struck such a blow at German morale as it had never sustained before. As the German support divisions moved up, they met men who shouted to them, You want to prolong the war? If the enemy were only over the Rhine, the war would be over. We thought we'd set the thing going. Now you fools are cooking up a hole again. Ludendorff was appalled at the reports which reached him. 
Everything I had feared had here in one place become a reality. Our war machine was no longer efficient. The 8th of August put the decline of our fighting power beyond all doubt. The war must be ended. More slowly now, but steadily, the Allies pressed forward. On August the 11th, there was a meeting of the German Supreme Command. Ludendorff offered his resignation, but it was not accepted. The truth, however, could not be disguised. The Kaiser told his generals, I see that we must strike a balance. We have nearly reached the limit of our powers of endurance. The war must be ended. The war must be ended. At last, the realization came home. At last, the leaders of the German army, the mightiest instrument of power that the world had seen, knew that they could not win. The London Times wrote, The new Franco-British offensive initiated under the command of Sir Douglas Haig is one of the most gratifying surprises of the war. It surprised the British public just as much as the enemy, for never has a secret been better kept. Daunted by the collapse of so many false hopes in years past, the British public only hesitatingly comprehended what its army had achieved. In Germany, and among her weakened and wearied allies, realization came more swiftly. A Vienna paper wrote, The German retreat on the Marne concerns us just as much as if our own troops had been fighting there. And the beating hearts with which we followed the news of the battle at Amiens are inspired by a comprehension of the extent to which our destiny is interwoven with these events. Austria needed peace. Bulgaria needed peace. Turkey needed peace. Now Germany was learning that she too needed peace. But what sort of peace? The voice of the Junker insisted, I should like to say to our people, do not lose your nerves. Do not become sentimental. Show a hard face to your enemies and say plainly to them that you need this and need that and therefore will keep that much of what you have taken from them because you are the conquerors. Germany began to learn that there could be no negotiating of peace, no compromise accommodation. The righteous wrath of the American people embodied in President Wilson. The determination of Britain passionately asserted by Lloyd George, would not contemplate such a thing. And Clemenceau had spoken for France. I, gentlemen, I wage war. In domestic policies I wage war. In foreign policies I wage war. Always, everywhere, I wage war. And I shall continue to wage war until the last quarter of an hour. How long, O oh Lord? How long before the flood of crimson welling carnage shall abate? From sodden plains in west and east, the blood of kindly men streams up in mists of hate, polluting thy clean air. And nations great in reputation of the arts that bind the world with hopes of heaven sink to the state of brute barbarians whose ferocious mind gloats o'er the bloody havoc of their kind, not knowing love or mercy. Lord, how long shall Satan in high places lead the blind to battle for the passions of the strong? Peace was still a distant vision in August 1918. In the mood of all the warring nations, there was still a steep outstanding debt to be paid in blood and destruction. The fight went on. Marshal Foch, he became a Marshal of France on August the 6th, widened the battlefront southward, drawing in new French armies. Now Haig widened the British front of attack also. On August the 21st, his third army opened the Battle of Bapaume, Bapaume fell to the New Zealanders on August the 30th. 
In this battle, the British captured 34,000 men and 270 guns. Before it ended, Haig flung in his first army, attacking still further to the north, along the River Scarp. Their fight produced 16,000 prisoners and 200 guns. And so into September, and yet another battle by the 4th and 3rd armies. 12,000 prisoners and 100 guns. It was a majestic progress at last, after long years of waiting and enduring. But the cost was high for men who had fought so long. At home, the British people began to have the sense of victory. One by one, the headlines stilled their doubts. August the 23rd, new British advance. August the 24th, British front ablaze. August the 26th, pressing the advance. August 27th, battle front spreading. August the 28th, allies sweep forward. August the 30th, the flowing tide. The Times commented, The arrival of our forces at Bapholm set the scene on a wonderful weekend and brought into view possibilities which were certainly not in sight a week ago. The Germans are retreating at such a pace that people are beginning to ask whether they'll be able to stand on the old Hindenburg line. The sense of victory gripped the Allied commanders. Haig told his generals, Risks which a month ago would have been criminal to incur ought now to be incurred as a duty. Yet there remained, between the Allies and the growing vision of victory, a great and formidable obstacle, the Hindenburg Line. Here, the German soldiers, dispirited, tired, gravely weakened in numbers, might be expected to make a stand and display again that stubborn courage in adversity which had sustained them so often before. As September drew to an end, it became clear that only the whole strength of the Allies on the Western Front could guarantee Germany's overthrow. Marshal Foch coined a slogan, Tout le monde à la bataille, everyone go to it. Now the Americans joined in, fighting as an army in their own right. Already on September the 12th, they had cleared the saint Miguel salient near the famous fortress of Verdun, taking 15,000 prisoners and 450 guns. It was a fine achievement in their first great offensive. But now, for the massed blow of the whole alliance, the direction of the American effort had to be changed. By a tremendous feat of organization and administration, the ever-expanding American army was shifted to the Argonne to strike northward while the French and British marched east. And in the north, the Belgian army also would attack, beside the British Second Army, fighting under the orders of King Albert of the Belgians. By September the 26th, all was ready. French and Americans struck hard. Then the haste with which the attack had been mounted told against them. The Americans suffered heavy casualties. These they could have borne in the enthusiasm that impelled them. But on this desolate ground, their transport broke down. Supplies could not be got to the troops in action. The wounded could not be removed. The American onslaught slowed and stopped. It didn't matter. On September the 27th, the British 3rd and 1st Armies struck at the Hindenburg Line itself and made a breach 12 miles wide and 6 miles deep. got to the wire there, it was terrific. It was about four foot high, and I would say about 15 yards wide. But the tanks who'd gone in front of us, 
they had ploughed through it like a ship in the sea. And we had no difficulty at all in walking in their tracks through the wire. We also got over the Hindenburg front line. On the 28th, the Second Army and the Belgians took up the tale at Ypres and crossed the entire battleground of Passchendaele, where the British had fought for three bloody months in 1917 in one day. And on that day, too, the Fourth Army, with Americans fighting beside the Australians, joined in to the south. In obstinate rearguards and heroic groups, parts of the German army continued to battle on by virtue of soldierly instinct and tradition. But other parts of it, chalked on the railway wagons that took them to the front, slaughter cattle for Wilhelm and sons. Hindenburg wrote, What terrible demands were made in these few weeks on the physical strength and moral resolution of the officers and men of all the staffs and formations. The only order issued in many cases was simply, hold out to the last, hold out. What a renunciation after so many glorious days of brilliant victories. I was faced with the question, the worst of all questions, when must the end be? The end of slaughter, the end of lunatic damage, the end of hate. The end must be now, at once. But how could it be achieved? Victors and defeated alike met the problem with bewildered stares. War is easy to declare, but peace, peace in 1918 was an elusive prize.